And God, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, for the way that your Spirit moves, the way that your Spirit guides and leads. And on this day, on this day, we pray that the Spirit would move into those places in our hearts that are grieving and hurting and afraid and torn. Move into the quiet places. We pray, God, that your Spirit would move into those places that we don't even understand, those places that don't seem to make sense. You know that many of us have places in our lives and our hearts that we're tired of even trying to figure out. And we need your spirit. Show us the way. Yes, God, you've never felt us yet. And you are here. And so I pray, God, that by your grace, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be in alignment with you and your heart and your love. Amen. So 20 years have passed, and yet have they? For those of us 20 years ago who remember where we were and what we were doing, and yet even today we're not entirely sure all that we felt then or all that we felt now and are feeling now. The experiences of 20 years ago are as varied as there are people. 9-11 continues. So what do we do with grief, with with memory? And and for those of you who are younger and were born after 9-11 or were too young to know what that was at the time, think back to the time when you first heard about it and what your heart was feeling. Though 20 years have passed, the grief still feels fresh to so many, and the wounds still feel raw. The way forward at times feels more like a roller coaster than it does a gentle path, and grief is like that. So so what do we do with the memories of this tragedy, knowing that it's mixed with others? Most recently, we've experienced January 6th, and trying to make sense of that the grief and the hurt, the ongoing grief of COVID-19, the uncertainty. Or we can actually even go back to distant memories like the Holocaust and over 6 million Jews who died along with LGBTQ plus people, along with others, political prisoners. Uh, Even that grief from, from World War II is still present in so many ways. And then beyond the corporate tragedies, there are the personal experiences that we have that are mixed in with all of this. The losses in our own lives, the ongoing loss in our lives, the things that we're trying to figure out, the things that we bring with us to church, the things that sometimes we try to to hide because we're afraid to be vulnerable. What do we do with complex grief and complex loss? Well, some of us want to forget it. We, we live in a culture, in fact, that you could call closure culture. P- people just want to close on the pain and put it behind. And the reality is that pain is there and trying to close it just pushes it down. I have a friend who specializes in grief and he says, you don't close on grief. You close on a house, but people try to close on grief and loss. So our deepest calling may seem counterintuitive. Our deepest calling is not to forget. Our deepest calling is to remember. To remember that whatever happened, be it 9-11 or a friend dying of COVID-19, whatever it is, to remember that God was present, God is present, and God will be present. Remember, when painful memories are centered in the abiding memory of faith, 
there is hope. That's one of the greatest values of sacred text, is it calls us back to those moments when God moved beyond people's belief in ways that were surprising yet true. In the scriptures, we can look back and see how God was present for our ancestors during the worst times. But our ancestors also struggled with remembering. At times like us, they forgot who they were. In Psalm 77, the psalmist has forgotten who God is. And in forgetting who God is, they cry out and say, God, I am in deep trouble. All night long I prayed, and you didn't comfort me. I moaned, I longed for help. I can't sleep, I'm too distressed to pray. Oh God, have you rejected me forever? Ever pray a prayer kind of like that? <laughs> Seems like God's not listening. Like your prayers are empty, like they're just floating out there somewhere. Have you ever gotten so tired of praying you've just quit? The psalmist was in that kind of place. And then something shifted and the psalmist remembered and thought back to the work of God and the ancestors. And the psalmist says, I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember. I will remember the wonders of old. And God, I will meditate on your work and muse on your mighty deeds. Notice that the feeling has not necessarily kicked in yet. But the psalmist is turning to that place of thinking and meditating and musing and being present to the memory. Remember. Our scripture today from James 1 is a reminder to center our lives in memory. In the memory of the message. And then to live that message out. James 1 says, if someone merely listens to the message and does not live it out, that one is like someone who gazes at their own face in a mirror and then goes out and immediately forgets who they are. It's in remembering who we are that we flourish as a people of hope. Wayne Muller in his book Sabbath said, the heart of most spiritual practice is simply this. Remember who you are. Remember what you love. Remember what is sacred. Remember what is true. Remember that you will die and that this day is a gift. And remember how you wish to live. So what do we do with all this stuff? First of all, we remember who we are. Beloveds, remember who you are. Now here I would like to suggest a spiritual practice. Even before the day is out, I invite you to find a quiet moment and look in the mirror. As James 1 says, look in the mirror. And take a good look. And ask yourself, who am I? As you look at yourself in the mirror, know that you are loved by God. As you look in the mirror, know that God thinks you are fabulous and beautiful. As you look into the mirror, take a moment to also look into your eyes. And it's been said, the eyes are the window into the soul. So look into your own eyes and see your own soul. And then ask yourself, who am I? I am God's own. I am God's beloved. I am created with divine intent. I am created to love. I am worthy. I am worthy of looking at myself and believing in myself and knowing that I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Look at yourself and see love looking back. Now, I'll be a little vulnerable here. I've tried this. And it was a little difficult. And at one point, I even felt myself a little overwhelmed by that moment and wanting to look away. And yet I looked. And the more I looked, the more I knew that God really does love me. Remember who you are. You are loved. And it's not about your position. It's not about your possessions. It's not about any titles or achievements. God loves you for you. Remember who you are. And then remember what you love. Sometimes we get so busy in life that we forget the things that bring us joy. 
So think of one or two things as a spiritual practice and ask yourself, when's the last time I did that, whatever it is? Maybe it's going swimming. Maybe it's creating some crazy art. <laughs> ask yourself what it is that you love to do. And if you've not done it for a while, do it and feel the love come back in your life. And then remember what is sacred. We live in a world where it seems like so much is disposable and so much is cheap. So what are some things that remind you of the sacred? It, it may be a, a candle on your home altar. It may be a tree in your neighborhood that you stop and have a little conversation with once in a while. What means something to you? and reminds you of value and worth. Especially during times of loss and grief, it's important to hold on to something that really matters. Remember what is sacred. Then remember where is sacred. Go there. For me, the MCCDC chapel just above you is a place where I like to go and get recentered. On those busy, crazy days, I go there and I spend some time with our ancestors. Sometimes we're called to go on pilgrimage. Today is my parents' 62nd wedding anniversary, and they are on a pilgrimage back to the city where they met. They're traveling from Idaho to Lubbock, Texas, where they met at the First Nazarene Church back 60, over, back, well, 63 years ago at this point. They were married in about a year. As they go on pilgrimage, I'm not able to go with them in person, but I can go with them in my mind. And a sacred place in our family's history is Hamlin, Texas, the house where my dad was born, a little house built shortly after the turn of the last century. And what makes that place sacred is what happened there. When we gathered for family reunions, when 9 o'clock came, my grandfather would call us all into the living room near the family Bible, and every one of us would kneel. And then granddad would pray, and pray, and pray. And he would call every family member there in the room, and cousins and distant cousins not in the room, by name. Now what's powerful in that is that in later years, when I was miles and miles away from there, and at times feeling lost, nine o'clock would come around, and I'd often remember that my grandfather and my grandmother were praying for me in that sacred place. Now I can only go there in my mind, in my heart, because that house is no longer a part of the family, but it's still there and it's still in our hearts. What are your sacred places? Where do you seek to go on pilgrimage? Go on a pilgrimage today, even if it's a pilgrimage in your heart. Remember today that we are called to know who we are, what we love, what's sacred, where is sacred, and then how do we want to live? Let, let's take all of that and decide how we want to live. We can live with anger and we can live with revenge, and we know that we live in a country right now where there are lots of revenge going on with the partisan politics. People are choosing to live in divided places. But we have a choice to step away from the, rem from the mirror and decide who we're going to be and how we're going to live. We have a choice every day to say, I'm going to live this way. I'm going to pray for those who I disagree with. That's how I'm going to live. I'm going to live with hope, even when it seems hopeless. I'm going to live with facing what I'm feeling inside. And sometimes that means going ahead and crying and letting the tears fall and not try to push them down. Tears, after all, are a form of prayer, so let's pray with our tears. This is how I'm going to live. I'm going to do something to lift somebody else up. Yes, I may be feeling down, but I can do something. It may be something really small, but it will bring love into the world, and it may, over time, make a big difference. Remember, remember who you are, what you love, what's sacred, and those places that are sacred in your life. Let us go there together. Remember, beloveds, remember. Amen.